Some days I can't say why I'm feeling lonely. Some days I am too proud to ask for help. And I stumble through the noise, trying to find some peace. A stranger in the crowd, I lose myself. So I walk down to the river where the troubles they can't find me but the waters there remind me the sun will be there when we wait so i walk down to the river though i might not understand it it's not always as we planned it but we grow stronger when we break so i walk Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Medford United Methodist Church. It's good to have you with us. My name is Joe Monahan, and uh, on behalf of the congregation, the staff, everybody here, we just want to say thank you so much for being with us today. It's so great to welcome some new folks this morning, and we thank you for joining us as well. We welcome those of you who are joining us online this morning, and uh, we are beginning a new series today, and it's going to go for the next four weeks, and it's called Half Truths, and it's based on a book of the same name by a Adam Hamilton. And in this book, what he does is he looks at some of the things that we commonly say to each other, um, sayings that sound vaguely biblical but maybe aren't quite biblical, and taking a look at those and uh, talking about the ways in which they are and aren't true. So that's where we're headed today. Today we're talking about everything happens for a reason, and uh, so I look forward to sharing that with you in just a few moments. Um, 
So if you're joining us in person today, we hope that you'll take a minute, that you'll check in on Facebook, let people know where you worship. If you're online with us, we hope that you'll share the stream. It really helps us to connect with more people. Also, uh, the ushers will come around in just a moment with the red attendance pads, and when they do that, I hope that you'll share your contact information, especially if you're visiting with us maybe for the first time, so that we can uh, add you to our mailing list. We'd love to let you know about things that are going on here at the church. We send out a weekly email. And uh, if you're online, you can also connect to the attendance form. You can go to medfordumc.org Sunday, and there you'll find a whole list of things that you can do, um, including the attendance form, uh, prayer requests. You can uh, download our app. You can connect to this week's announcements. And if you're in the room, we want to give you the opportunity to do the same thing, and you can explore a little bit about the church. And that's uh, what you see in that QR code that's on the back of the seat in front of you. If you scan that, you'll be able to connect uh, to medfordumc.org slash Sunday. So today I want to remind you of a couple things as we get started. First, uh, we have every year our church conference, and that's a meeting where we uh, gather together to hear updates on the church's ministry. We elect leaders, and we engage in some conversation with our district superintendent about where we're going. We have a new district superintendent this year, so this is an opportunity for us to meet her. And that's going to be taking place on October the 7th at 3 p.m., that's a Saturday, Saturday, October the 7th at 3 p.m. on Zoom. And uh, we'll send out the Zoom link uh, to those uh, who are on our mailing list. And uh, all of our members are encouraged and invited to attend, and we hope we can see you there. Second, today after the worship service, the second worship service, we're going to have our church picnic. Uh, it's going to be inside, it, obviously, because of the weather. It's going to be in this space. Uh, but this is a great time of food and opportunities for us to connect. So I hope that if you're looking for ways to meet more people, that you will uh, think about coming. And that is going to be kicking off at noon here in this space. And then finally, today, we want to take a moment and we want to introduce to you somebody who's very special to us. Um, our new director of the Medford Methodist Pre-K program. As you know, our former director, Mary Beth Lloyd, stepped down after 28 years. Today, we are excited to introduce to you uh, Caitlin Thornton, who's been on the staff now for a few years, and now, uh, as of September 1st, is taking over as the director. So, Caitlin, would you come? And uh, we'd love to hear from you and give you the opportunity to introduce yourself. Introducing me, I'm Caitlin Thornton. I've actually been in the Medford Methodist preschool community for about nine years. Um, my daughter and I were looking for a preschool for her, and I fell in love with the school. Um, it was welcoming to myself and my child, and I got to volunteer. I was Scholastic's mom. Um, I got to sub a few times as well. Um, I actually moved to Medford when I was in third grade, and um, I really just, I have been around for a long time. Um, so I left teaching when I had my second child, and then once my youngest was ready to come to preschool, I decided, okay, well, where do I want to work? And I had been in the school for a few years, so I asked Mrs. Lloyd, I said, if you ever have a spot, please let me know. I love your staff. I love the students. I love the families. Please keep me in mind. And actually, the end of that year, she said, I have an opening. Um, so that was five years ago. Um, fast forward to now, and now I'm the new director. Um, preschool to me is the foundation for education, so it gets everyone off on the right foot. When they go to kindergarten, they hit the ground running. They are ready socially, emotionally, academically. Um, and so that's our basis here. Um, two goals of mine are that we are always safe when we're here and we're always important when we're here. Um, we're safe in our body, we're safe with our emotions, we're safe um, in our space. Um, and you're important. I want to hear from the children, I want to hear from the parents, I like to hear from my staff. You are why we're here. Um, so I'll just leave you with that. I won't drag it out too long, but I'm just, I'm very excited. We've already started off this year um, in my eyes, the best yet. Um, the kids coming back from three years with COVID and wonky schedules um, have some normalcy this year, and we're very excited for that. We have um, parent volunteers coming back into the classroom with us. Um, the staff have 
rearrange their rooms um, to create a more welcoming environment for the students. Um, but I can ramble on for hours. So thank you very much. Thank you, Pastor Joe. Thank you so much. <laughs> we are really excited to have Caitlin as our new director and I look forward to uh, a long and a fruitful relationship and we are just really excited about her presence here with us. Let's begin this morning's uh, worship with an opening prayer, and we'll invite you to pray that with me as we put it up on the screen. Come, Holy One, teach us your ways, lead us in your paths, guide us on our journey. Speak to us your words of life, for you offer us direction and wholeness when we hear your voice and follow. You bless us with your love, shower us with your grace, and help us grow in faith. We seek you, O God, with all our hearts. Be near us this day. Amen. Good morning, everyone. As you are comfortable and able, please stand with us as we lift our voice in praise. The God of creation took our place. The God of redemption opened the way. The day you gave your life, it seemed a failure in our eyes. But the stone you rolled away as you walked out of that grave. salvation change everything the day you gave your life it seemed a failure in our eyes but the stone
this one, sing it with me. When darkness tries to roll over my bones, when sorrow comes to steal the joy I own, when brokenness and pain is all I know, no, I won't be shaken. comfortable and you're able, let's greet our neighbor. of all grace, we invite you here today. God, we're grateful for this opportunity to lift our voice together as one. Lord, be with us now as we prepare for your word. In your holy name we pray. Okay, 
I know I have lots of friends back there. I could hear you all, and I saw you, so you kind of come up front with me. Here comes the entrepreneur. We had, we had an Italian restaurant going, didn't you? Good morning. Good morning. How are all of you? Hi, how are you? <laughs> it's great seeing you all. And for anybody else out there who didn't come up front, that's fine. So, this morning, um, <clears throat> part of what we're going to talk about is choices. So, there's a lot of choices that we make every day. Um, we choose what to wear. Do you choose what you wear most days? Yeah. So do you put, do you put flip flops on in the middle of a snowstorm in winter? No. Do you put your heavy winter coat on in the summer? Because what would happen if you did? You would, what would you do? You would sweat and sweat a lot, huh? And we choose, um, do most of you choose what you have for breakfast or does mom or dad or somebody else choose for you? Do you choose? What do you like to have for breakfast? Pancakes? What do you like, Aspen? Apples? That's exciting because you're picking the good stuff, huh? Yeah. Um, sometimes we have to make choices during the day, uh, whether we're going to play on the swings, whether we might play basketball. Um, a lot of choices, those type of choices, don't really make such a big deal, do they? So like if you chose to have the waffles instead of the apples, it really doesn't make that much difference, does it? So, but some decisions, some choices that we make, they can make a really big difference. And if we don't make the right choice, there's consequences. Does anybody know what that word, like, there's consequences? Does anybody know what that means, Morgan? You can get in trouble. <laughs> Absolutely. Sometimes it's getting in trouble with yourself. Sometimes it's trouble with a teacher or your parents. And guess who else you might be able, you're going to get in trouble with? You can get in trouble with God, yes. And so God wants us, obviously, to choose good versus bad. He wants us to choose life over death. And he wants us to choose him. He wants us to choose um, to follow him. Now, a couple things. When we're talking about food choices. So, what do you think? Cookies or banana? And I know some of you are going to be really good and pick the banana, aren't you? I love bananas. You love bananas? I can tell you somebody who would not be picking a banana, and that would be my daughter, Danielle, because she does not like bananas. You either? Yeah. You like the cookies? Okay. Now we have beets. Beets. Or lots of M&Ms. You love M&Ms. So most people would be picking the M&Ms, huh? But 
if you eat too many M&Ms, what might happen? You might get sick. So that's a consequence of kind of maybe making not such a great decision, making a great choice. Right, that's called self-control and only eating a few after you had your dinner. So you eat your beets first, everybody. <laughs> and then you can have a few M&Ms. How many of you would pick the beets? I like beets. <laughs> Do you like beets? Yeah? <laughs> so, um, it seems with a lot of things that it would be really easy, especially when God asks us to follow him and to choose good over bad. Seems like it would be a really easy thing to do. But what happens? We mess up sometimes, don't we? And we sit down and we eat a couple M&Ms and then we eat a few more and then we eat a few more and then the next thing you know, we maybe have a tummy ache. Well, same thing happens with a lot of things that we do. So maybe we know we should be kind to somebody, but we aren't. Because that's one of the things when we follow God, that we're he's, because we're following God, it helps us hopefully to make good choices. So we listen to our parents. So we do our homework maybe instead of playing a video game? Because what would be the consequence of not doing your homework? Getting, yeah, getting an F on your test. You are really good at that whole compromise and doing the right thing before you do the maybe not so good thing, huh? <laughs> um, but there's consequences. What happens if you're mean to somebody instead of being kind. They won't. Right, they might be mean back. And who would be disappointed? They would be disappointed, a teacher might be disappointed. Who else would be disappointed? Avery? God would be disappointed. And guess what? Even when we make mistakes, even when we choose to eat too many M&Ms, or eat the cookies instead of the banana, or maybe play the video game instead of doing the homework. And even when we get in trouble, who's always, always with us? God is always with us, yes. He's right there through all of the bad things. Even, I know it's, it's real easy to know he's there when everything is going smooth. But when things are going rough, when you're getting into trouble, when you're really sad, when somebody's really sick, that God is there with us and helping us even through all those bad times and bad choices. Okay, can we bow our heads? And can you repeat after me? Dear God, thank you for choosing us. And for, loving us. and for loving us. Thank you for forgiving us, Thank you for forgiving us. When, we make when we make mistakes. Help us always, Help us always. To, come to, to come back to you. Thank you for your son Jesus. Thank you for your son, Jesus. And thank you for your love. We love you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Today's reading comes from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 13, verses 15 through 20. 
Look here. Today I've set before you life and what's good versus death and what's wrong. If you obey the Lord your God's commandments that I'm commanding you right now, by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways, and by keeping his commandments, his regulations, and his case laws, then you will live and thrive. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your hearts turn away, and you refuse to listen and are so misled, worshiping other gods and serving them, I am telling you right now that you will definitely die. You will not prolong your life on the fertile land that you are crossing the Jordan River to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth as my witnesses against you right now. I have set life and death, blessing and curse before you. Now choose life so that you and your descendants will live by loving the Lord your God, by obeying his voice and by clinging to him. That's how you will survive and live long in the fertile land that the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the gift of the scriptures and for the way that your work in them, even up to this day. And we pray that as we think about them together, that you might be at work in these words that I speak, so that whether through me or in spite of me, that you might make yourself heard here this morning to, among your people. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Everything happens for a reason. Most of us were raised on some level on this saying, heard it a thousand times, maybe you've said it a thousand times. Today, like I said at the start of worship, that we are uh, starting a new series based on this book by Adam Hamilton, if you want to look at it. And in this series, what we're going to do is examine some of these common sayings that we throw out all the time. And we're going to ask ourselves, are these things really true? theologically, biblically speaking, are they really true? And what do they say, if they are true, what do they say about God and what do they say about us? You'll find that most of them have at least some degree of a biblical foundation. And so each week we're going to talk about some of those passages that point to these. And I suspect that today's Everything Happens for a Reason probably comes from Romans 8, 28. See if you can recognize the connection. We know that God works all things together for good for the ones who love God, for those who are called according to His purpose. Everything happens for a reason, does have the feeling of a connection between God works all things together for good, right? And we'll talk in a few minutes about how the two overlap, because remember, we're talking about half-truths. We're talking about how this idea that's being expressed by the saying doesn't necessarily tell the whole story. I don't know if you've ever bristled when somebody said this to you. Maybe you couldn't put your finger on exactly why it was troublesome, or maybe you were immediately able to put your finger on why it was troublesome. But either way, I hope that by the end of this message, you'll get a little bit more insight into it. I mean, everything happens for a reason certainly can be a source of comfort if we're able to claim it for ourselves. In other words, if it's us saying it about us in our own lives. And usually, that's only true when three conditions apply. And I think all three have to apply. First, that situation is in the rearview mirror. It's behind us. That's the first thing. Second, no one has been seriously injured, spiritually, morally, physically, or otherwise. Third, everything has worked out better than expected. It's got to be behind us. 
Nobody got hurt, and it's worked out better than what we expected. And at that point, everything happens for a reason, does sound a lot like an expression of faith in line with Romans 8.28. All things work together for good for those who love God. But now think for a second about how we most often hear this saying. Usually it's from the lips of a person who is very well-meaning, who encounters us in a moment where we're not having such a great day, but they don't know what else to say. Maybe you've experienced this. Maybe you've been that person. I don't know what else to say, but this sounds like it might help. Now, they might be tempted to say this even though one or more of those conditions that I spoke about previously are not met. In other words, the person is still going through the thing, whatever it is. They're still in the midst of it. When there are people around you who are suffering and hurting and or it's unclear whether everything is going to work out in your favor or not. If you say that to someone who is in that state, I guarantee you're going to hurt them with it. I guarantee it. Think about this. Just put yourself in these situations. You just lost your job. Everything happens for a reason. You've just been diagnosed with cancer. Everything happens for a reason. There's just been a terrible car accident. Everything happens for a reason. Can I tell you something important about how it is that you walk with people who are in pain? There are times when it is infinitely better to say nothing at all. Or simply to say, my Lord, that's awful. What can I do to help? There are times when those are really the only acceptable responses. Silence or that's awful. What can I do to help? That's so much better than saying something that might hurt or to say something that's going to be untrue. Because there are moments, yes, when wise words will help someone get through something. But when circumstances are objectively awful, the truth is, nothing you can say will make things better. Nothing. Nothing. And especially not, well, everything happens for a reason. So first, timing is important. You have to be past the thing. And second, the person saying it is important. You can say it about your own life and your own circumstances. I wouldn't say it about someone else's life and someone else's circumstances. So, are there other problems with this saying? I've already pointed out kind of the most important one. Well, today's scripture illustrates the other one. Throughout the Bible, humanity is offered choices. Human agency and free will, at least in our understanding, from a Methodist perspective on the Scripture, human agency and free will are absolutely assumed in our theology. That's our understanding of the world. We do not believe that God is a puppet master who works the strings and we dance. We call that idea determinism. 
that's the belief that God is in control of absolutely everything, that God decides everything, that God has already predetermined the outcome. Now, determinism is out of keeping with many passages of Scripture. I would say the majority of passages of Scripture. However, it can be found. It can be found. And so, churches in general are divided about this idea. But from our perspective, Methodists being very practical people, if we are not free to choose then what is the point? There isn't one. That's our perspective. And in this reading from Deuteronomy, Moses is summing up the law that he's just given for the second time to the people of Israel. He's recapping now. And as he does that, he puts this choice before them. Today I've set before you life and what's good versus death and what's wrong. On the one hand, you choose life and health by following God's ways. On the other hand, you choose death and destruction by disobeying them. You decide how to live. And this is the predominant theology of the Hebrew Scriptures, the predominant theology of the Old Testament. If you do right, good things happen. But if you do wrong, watch out. Which is Interestingly, on some level, its own version of determinism. Because that idea operates with the assumption that humans can 100% control how things work out for them. You do right, everything will go well. You do wrong, everything will not. That's also a kind of determinism. And that can lead to some hurtful theology too like the belief that if something's going wrong in your life, then it must be your fault. That it's because of your sin. Job, as a book of the Bible, has as its, fundamentally, its sole purpose to contradict this belief. Job, when everything is going wrong, has people around him who are constantly saying to him, Job, just confess already, what is your problem? Clearly, there's something that you've done. But that's a message for a different day. Because today's message is about why everything happens for a reason is only half true. And it's only half true in large part because it takes away our ability to choose. And in fact, our responsibility to choose. And make no mistake that we are responsible. We are given a mandate by God to care for one another, to watch over one another in love and in comfort. And that's why the words that we use to share comfort with each other really matter. They really do. Because to fail at the work of kindness is to abdicate this responsibility that God has given us that God lays at our feet over and over and over again in so many ways, in so many passages of Scripture. What happens when we say everything happens for a reason is that we take that responsibility and instead of God laying that responsibility for our choices at our feet, we're taking that responsibility and laying it at God's feet. Which makes it hard to square with the most difficult and the most horrible things that happen in this world and in our lives. Genocide, school shootings, domestic violence. When people say everything happens for a reason, I sure hope they don't mean all those things. Because the only reason for those things is our own sinful, hurtful, harmful choices. They are not the plan, they are not the will of God. So do you see why this saying carries so much potential danger? 
Because when you say it to a friend who's going through something awful, you're essentially telling them that this terrible situation, well, that is God's will for you. To which any thinking person is likely to say, well, if that's true, then I'm out because I do not need that kind of God in my life. Why would I even want to be close to this God? And they'd be justified in saying that. So you can see how the wrong phrase uttered at the wrong time to the wrong person could potentially rob them of their greatest source of support, that is their faith. It could be turning someone away from God at just the moment when they need God the most. So look, the half-truth in this statement is actually a pretty, potent, a pretty potent one. The idea that God can make good or even great things happen in the face of really, really difficult and awful circumstances, it's important. And I don't want to throw it completely out because it is true. I've experienced it. Some of the most difficult things that have happened in my life have made me exactly who I am. And let's be honest, some of those difficult things were my own doing. You know, there's a meme that goes, everything happens for a reason. Sometimes the reason is that you're stupid and you make bad choices. Like, that's true. It's harsh, but it's true. And then I think back to other times where very clearly the things that I suffered was because of things that people did in the world around me, either to me directly or indirectly. And I'm grateful now that I am where I am, even though those things were objectively awful. So I can say it, and I believe it, deep within me, that God was able to use those moments, even moments of self-inflicted pain, for something that was good. That's what we call redemption. That's what we call grace. But that's very different than saying, God gave me that pain purposefully in order to make something good come out of it. Because I, if I believed, even just a little bit, that God purposefully and intentionally put that pain on me, then honestly, I don't know if I could ever be okay in my relationship with God it would be extraordinarily difficult. The eventual good outcome is not the reason you found yourself in that situation to begin with. To say that actually confuses the cause with the effect. God's gracious ability to bless us is an effect. It's not a cause. God didn't bring the pain into your life just to relieve it and be a hero. That's not how God works. So if I had to rate it, I'd say everything happens for a reason is maybe slightly less than a half truth. Maybe three-eighths of a truth, right? Something like that. Because while it leans toward a biblical truth, this idea that God works through our difficult circumstances we often use it so carelessly that it hurts more than it helps. And it lets us off the hook for choices that we are bound to make, that we're responsible for, while inadvertently pinning all the blame for everything on God. It's important that we speak the truth about God as best we can to one another. Even when somebody's going through something difficult and we don't know what to say, it's still important. And perhaps then even more important to speak the truth as best we can. 
about who God is and what God does in the world. That is our responsibility, very clearly our responsibility, to offer that kind of comfort when people are hurting. And so today, God has set before us blessings and curses. And so my hope is that today we can bless one another with words that are genuinely true, with words that lead toward life. And when we don't have them, to be silent. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for working through even the most difficult circumstances in our lives to bring us to that place where we know that you have touched us, that you're working in and through and all around us, even in the most difficult things that we face. We thank you for your grace. And we pray that we might speak of that grace and convey it into the lives of those that we meet. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. had a plan for me even though I couldn't see it you had a hope and a promise for my life I never walked alone but I struggled to believe it every step I took you never left my side oh every step I took you never left my your relentless love is ever chasing me, and your amazing grace has opened my eyes, and now I can see. I tried to run away. My life was a disaster. There's not a broken dream that you cannot redeem. You never turned away. Though I gave you every reason, what you have started, you were faithful to complete. Oh, what you have started, you were faithful to complete. And you're Your amazing grace has opened my eyes, and now I can see. When I fell down, you picked me up. When I was not, you were enough. When I was bound, you set me free. And at my worst, you did not leave. When I was darkness, you were light. When I was dead, you new life. And God, you changed my destiny. And now the only thing I see is your relentless love is ever chasing me. Your amazing grace
couldn't see it. You had a hope and a promise for my So friends, as we uh, continue to worship today, we are going to talk for just a moment about an exciting project that we are going to be working on over the next month or so. And uh, Barb Carlson from Outreach and from the United Methodist, United Methodist Women, United Women of Faith is going to speak about, is going to speak about a project that we're going to be undertaking over the next few weeks. So Barb. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Good morning. Uh, As Joe said, I'm Barbara Carlson. I'm president of the United Women in Faith. And on behalf of all of the leadership of our church and our pastor, we'd like to say first that we are especially grateful for all of the ways that you give to the missions of this church. church. And if you want to make a donation or offering today, we of course have baskets in the back and the side of the church. And you can also donate online go to our medford umc app if you wish to do that however you give whether it is your financial support or simply your prayers your presence your service and witness to this church we are especially thankful this fall i'm excited to tell you about the two opportunities to give first comes um this this week we have dining for dollars which is a UMW or United Women of Faith uh, uh, opportunity to purchase a meal uh, at Ileano's Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday evening, and then they donate the profits to us, which goes to Providence House. But mostly, I'm excited to tell you about the We Care Moveathon, and that's happening this October for the month of October. The We Care Moveathon is a move-a-thon that's going to sponsor the Bridge of Hope, which is a program by the Christian Caring Center. It's a move-a-thon like none other. Instead, we are talking about what moves people to help others. Why? Because the Bridge of Hope is a program of the Christian Caring Center that confronts homelessness and helps to support families with children in need. And you can donate simply by using a QR code that we'll have. You'll see it online. Um, And also, we'll have some folks that are handing out these sheets in the back of the church today that has the QR code if you wish to give. And again, we have all of October. Why are we doing this? We are trying to raise $12,000. That's a lot, I know. $12,000 for the Bridge of Hope program. We are trying to raise $12,000 because that is the cost to support one family through the program for one year. Yes, $12,000 is an ambitious goal, but I think that we can get there with your help. Now, we have, and through the month of October, we are excited about this We Care Move-A-Thon, and mostly we're excited to tell you today about the We Care Festival that will be happening happening October 14th from 5 to 7 p.m. Join us for food and fun and to learn a little bit about homelessness. Also join us as we celebrate that same night with our friends from the Christian Caring Center as they will be doing a sleep out along with some of the youth of our church. They will be symbolically sleeping out either in their cars. Our youth will be staying over in Booker Hall with uh, support from our church, adult support, and um, whether you come to cheer them on or just come to have some good food and some fellowship and learn a little bit, we would appreciate your support. In fact, we do need some people to help out with that day and night. Um, Let's see. The Bridge of Hope is an important program that we are trying to support, like I said, for that $12,000, I know we can get there, What is it that will help you be a bridge of hope for someone in need? What would move you to help others? Here's a picture of some friends last year when we were doing Push or Tush, another another kind of move-a-thon. That's what excites me is being out in nature 
And also, there's another picture of kids from uh, our VBS over the summer. That's exciting. That moves me to help people. And I believe that it helps you as well. What moves me? Our church moves me to support others. So join us, won't you, as we take on this project of the We Care Move-a-thon. And now my friends in the booth are going to show you a short little clip about the Bridge of Hope. Thank you. On the road of life, we all need good neighbors. Families facing homelessness need good neighbors. Jesus calls us to be a good neighbor. Who do you call when your child is sick? When your car doesn't start and you need to get to work? When you need help moving? A neighbor. A good neighbor is someone who offers encouragement and one whom you can count on to help you out. On the road of life, we all need good neighbors. Families facing homelessness need good neighbors. Jesus calls us to be a good neighbor. He calls us to expand our own neighborhood beyond the family living next door. To Jesus, neighboring includes those who live across town, in different neighborhoods, and those without a place to call home. A good neighbor is anyone who responds to someone in need. So who is a neighbor to a family facing homelessness? Like the Good Samaritan, Bridge of Hope is about being a good neighbor to homeless families. Neighboring is learning from and walking with each other. Neighboring moves us from strangers to acquaintances to relationships. A Bridge of Hope neighborhood includes families facing homelessness, neighboring volunteers from Christian faith communities, and a Bridge of Hope case manager. Neighboring. It's building a community of support for homeless families. It is living out the call of loving our neighbors as ourselves. Friends, we look forward to uh, continuing to uh, raise awareness for this program and also raising money to uh, help fund this program, something that's desperately needed here in Burlington County because uh, Burlington County is really woefully under-resourced in terms of homelessness. Uh, we don't have a permanent uh, homeless shelter anywhere in the county, for example. So these types of programs that tra tra transition people from homelessness into their own uh, apartments is a really important one. So I hope that you'll uh, participate in this program during the month of October. We're going to take some time now to go to God in prayer, and as we do that, uh, we want to give you the opportunity to lift up People that you're praying for, if you're online with us, we encourage you to uh, pray along with us. And as you share uh, names of people you're praying for, we invite you to use first names only. Let's take some time now to go to God in prayer. Lord, we thank you for all the ways that you have challenged us to live into this calling that we've been given, to care for others. We heard of one just now. We think about others when we reflect on the sermon for this morning. We know that there are people in our lives who are struggling and who could use encouragement and hope. And we pray that as we come alongside people and walk with them, that you'll give us the wisdom to know how to speak truth, but perhaps even more importantly, when to speak and when to be silent. So we pray for that wisdom. And we pray for that truth. God, we lift up a world today that is hurting. We read of wars and 
natural disasters and human-made disasters and violence in so many places. And today, we just lift up efforts around the world that people undertake to fulfill that biblical mandate to watch over one another in love. And we pray that you might give us the wisdom and the strength to do that. One of the ways that we watch over one another is to pray for one another. And so this morning, if there are people that you are praying for, we invite you to lift their names now. Lord, we thank you that when we pray that you hear us. We pray that you might be at work in each one of these lives, in each one of these situations. That you might provide comfort and peace and strength and healing. And most of all, the reassurance of your love. God, we are grateful for all that you've done for us, and we pray all these things in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now lift our voices together as we sing Hosanna. Please stand as you're able.
friends, go forth in this place to speak the truth to one another as best you know it, about how good God is, about how God works in the world, about how God has worked in your life. Go forth knowing that maybe everything happens for a reason, but only you can say that about your own life. And you can only say it after you've seen the fullness of all that God has done. Go forth in the name, the power, and the grace of Jesus Christ, knowing that God is the God of comfort, that you might bring comfort to the world that needs it. Amen. I know that we'll have to do something with these chairs, but I don't know what exactly in order to get ready. So, is that what we want to do?